Hello, my name is Kim Sampson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Immunisation Coalition. The presentation that we have for you today is by two of our directors, our chairman, Dr. Rod Pierce, who is a practicing GP in Adelaide and has been involved in the immunisation area for many, many years. The second is also a director, Professor Paul Griffin, who is an infectious diseases physician and microbiologist in Brisbane. And he's been active in vaccine development uh, for quite a few years and has a great deal of knowledge in that area. And I'm sure you will find in his presentation or his uh, answers to questions very interesting. My first question is to you, Paul. It's in relation to the vaccine and, and what, what actually goes into the vaccine. There is some concern by people that uh, there are th things in the vaccine that could be dangerous. And how do we know that you know, what goes into a vaccine is something that is safe for us? Thanks, Kim. I guess these days that the vaccine components are freely available. It's something you can find out either before you go to get your vaccine or even at the, the vaccine centre that you go to get your vaccine from. And really, there's not that much in these vaccines. There's the active component, which in the case of Pfizer and Moderna is an mRNA. In the case of AstraZeneca, it's the instructions to make the spike protein in a harmless virus, an adenovirus. And then other than that, there's really some basic components like buffers and stabilizers that we know are very safe. So there's really no chance of any extra things being in there. The quality control of these vaccines is enormous. We make sure that we know exactly what's in each and every dose from each and every batch. So there's really nothing else in these vaccines. Okay, uh, there has also been criticisms about the speed with which the vaccines were developed, that perhaps they've been rushed, that uh, corners have been cut. What have you got to say about that? Yeah, there's absolutely been no corners cut. While we have developed these vaccines seemingly very rapidly, we've done that by omitting a lot of steps that uh, add time but don't add anything to the clinical trial process. But we've not skipped any of the critical steps in terms of knowing these vaccines are as safe and effective as any of the other vaccines that we've developed. These vaccines were built upon years and years of research, perhaps arising from the first SARS in 2002. And we know that the people that have made these vaccines, Moderna, BioNTech, who helped make the Pfizer one, and the Oxford group that made AstraZeneca, well, they've been researching vaccines for a very long time. All of those groups in excess of 10 years. So while the vaccine seemed to come on the, uh, on the scene fairly quickly and be developed quickly, it was built on years and years of research and by omitting a lot of redundant steps in terms of things like fighting for funding and delays getting that sort of funding. We're able to do that, of course, because we had more funding than ever before for these vaccines. But again, we didn't skip any critical steps in terms of the development or the testing of these vaccines. Um, and then, so what about the approval process? There has been criticism leveled at uh, the TGA because the vaccines have only been given provisional approval until 2023. What's all that about? So the TGA have demonstrated time and time again, they're a very rigorous regulator. I mean, one example of that is that we were actually a little bit late to the party in terms of approving these vaccines. And they, they do that by making sure they observe all the clinical trial data, as well as the performance of these vaccines in the real world in other countries. And of course, they continue to monitor the performance of the vaccines, both in terms of safety and efficacy in our country. The provisional approval uh, is really just based on a, a matter of time, and I'm sure the full approvals will come uh, after they've had more time to review exactly how these vaccines are working here. But of course, if there was anything that was cause for concern, if they weren't continuing to be safe and effective in our hands, well, then they'd modify how they're used. And again, we saw that with AstraZeneca, a very cautious approach, but they did change the recommendation in terms of age there to make sure we're using these vaccines as safely and effectively as possible. Okay, thanks, Paul. Rod, I just want to put a couple of questions your way. Um, firstly, it's about the statistics, about the numbers that we're hearing. Can those statistics be trusted? For example, uh, we we're, it's reported that people are dying of COVID-19. The question is, how do we know they've actually died from COVID-19 and not merely died of something else? although they tested positive incidentally. So how, do, how can we be sure that they're actually dying of uh, COVID and can the statistics be trusted? So from a doctor's point of view, when we write a death certificate, we have to be comfortable that uh, we actually know what they died from. 
If we're not sure, we arrange an autopsy and that can be checked. And if someone dies unexpectedly, we normally get a coroner to actually look at why they died. Doctors have to sign a legal agreement. They're scrutinised. Their whole medical career can be uh, ruined if they lie or make any false statements. So there's no doctor in Australia who will be looking to actually make a false statement. And it's appropriate for us to give uh, the appropriate diagnosis. And um, when people look at uh, somebody's death, they look to see if they died from a heart attack or anything else. If they died from a heart attack, there's no reason why we want to change that. We would say they died from a heart attack. If they happen to have COVID at the same time, that will be put on the, the death certificate that they've had the two. Uh, and if we're not sure, we'll ask for another opinion to see what, what they died from. So there's absolutely no reason why anyone in Australia would want to falsify that. There's a process that doctors go through. It's the same whether someone dies from COVID, whether they die in an accident, whether they have a heart attack, whether they're in hospital, out of a hospital. There's a whole lot of processes that go through. So certainly in Australia, those figures are uh, open to scrutiny and, and lots of people look at them and they're valid. And there's no reason to think that if someone puts on a death certificate, someone died from COVID, that they didn't. So there's been some uh, talk also that um, we can't be really sure unless there's an autopsy uh, done on somebody who has been um, diagnosed as dying from uh, from COVID. Is that what's your view about that? I think that that something in Australia that if someone had an unexplained death, they would be actually looking for it because when. COVID arrived in Australia, we're all concerned is that we're either missing it or that maybe they're dying from something else. So in Australia, certainly uh, when we first saw uh, the illness come here, everyone's really careful to make sure that they're not putting onto, onto the death certificate anything other than what we can't prove. And that still goes on. And certainly in the big hospitals, uh, in nursing homes, we actually check to make sure that what's on the death certificate is appropriate. And it's double checked, it's certified by two doctors. They're independent. They've got no vested interest in making one diagnosis or another. And no one's going to put their name to a death certificate unless they're sure that that's what someone died of. Okay, and just staying on the, the topic of the validity of statistics, um, PCR tests are one of the uh, standard uh, methods we use for testing or, pr or identifying uh, the, the virus. Um, there is noise or chatter on throughout the internet, we see it from time to time, saying that PCR tests are unreliable and should not be trusted. What, what's that about? Okay, again, that's, that's like any other diagnosis and treatment program. If we see someone and they've actually got a different diagnosis, we'd want to treat it. We want a diagnosis to make sure that we can maximise the intervention. If we as a doctor can't rely on the diagnosis, we'll look elsewhere. There's some regulations being uh, uh, passed in Australia and certainly in South Australia, it's actually legal to use tests that we can't rely on. And so it's been a, a hallmark of our approach is to make sure we're 98, 99% sure that the test we're doing is actually confirming the right one. We've tested that, cross-checked it, uh, checked it with uh, sort of neutral samples, all that sort of stuff. That's constant rigour to make sure that, that the laboratories are checking for the right thing and confirming it. So if we have a PCR testing, certainly in South Australia and, and any lab in Australia, uh, we know that lab's accurate, we know it's a proper diagnosis, and we're talking 99% certainty. And so where do you think this doubt comes from with regard to PCR testing? Have you any idea? On, on my, my, my guess would be is because there's other tests like the antigen test, the rapid antigen test, which isn't so accurate, uh, that uh, maybe in the preliminary stages when people weren't sure, but once we actually get the virus isolated so we can actually test to see that our uh, PCR is actually accurate and we can actually match it to a test sample. We confirm exactly that that's what we're actually picking up, that we're actually picking up the real virus. And we've been doing thousands of them now and we actually know that we're accurate. But the original stages when we didn't have the virus, we couldn't match it. So I imagine it, it's like um, someone checking if, uh, you know, a car is a real car. You look under the bonnet, you look somewhere else, you check that, that the car you've stopped is actually a Ford or a Holden. Someone hasn't tried to uh, make it and you actually have ways of checking that, that you're correct. You might look at the history and all that sort of stuff. So doctors go through a process to make sure the diagnosis is right. We make sure the tests we're doing are accurate. If they're not ac accurate, we won't bother to use them because we can't rely on them, we can't treat them. And remember, if it's not COVID, it could be something we could treat, we could cure somebody. So we wanna know that as well. So there's 
no vested interest in anyone actually getting a, a false answer or uh, a misleading answer. We want to know what the diagnosis is. We want to maximise our treatment. If it's COVID, we can't treat it. If it's something else, we look for a cure. Okay, thanks, Rod. Back to you, Paul. I want to talk about uh, side effects. Um, should I, if I were, if, well, I have had the vaccine and I can say that uh, I had very minimal side effects, but there is concern uh, amongst parts of the population that uh, side effects can be serious. Um, should we be concerned? So definitely not. I would say we know these vaccines are very safe. Of course, I certainly welcome people wanting to know more about the vaccine and that information again is freely available. We know unfortunately every medical intervention, whether it's medications or vaccines, do come with side effects. But if the benefits don't far outweigh those risks, then we don't use these sort of things. And that's what the role of the TGA as our, our regulator is, for example. So with these vaccines, they all do come with uh, side effects. The vast majority of these side effects are mild, short-lived, go away without any intervention. And those sort of things are what you'd expect with any vaccine. So headache is the most commonly reported side effect at the moment, occurring at a rate of around 2.7 per thousand doses administered. And then there are some more serious side effects but these do remain very, very rare. And what we're talking about here is the rare clotting syndrome with AstraZeneca, for example, which as of a few weeks ago, we'd seen 77 confirmed uh, episodes out of over 11 million doses administered. And the rare side effect we're talking about more with the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna is something called myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. And while of course that sounds very significant, that also remains rare with around 450 cases out of over 13 million doses administered as of a few weeks ago. And again, the vast majority of those recover fully in a short space of time. So it's good to know about those so you can assess those risks. But when we look at the benefits conferred by these vaccines, as I say, it more than compensates for those very rare side effects that we very rarely see. Okay, so the vaccine hasn't been around for long. How do we, you know, there may be long-term side effects that we won't know about. You know, what, how do we, uh, how can we be comfortable about taking the vaccine without knowing about what those potential side effects might be? I guess one of the things to point out is that the technology is not necessarily new. Moderna, for example, have been making the mRNA vaccines for other viruses for over 10 years. I, in fact, did a clinical trial with a vaccine for a virus called RSV in 2015. And so we followed those volunteers for a long time. So we have been using exactly the same technology for different viruses for a long time. And then in terms of the testing of these vaccines, well, in fact, we did more testing than we'd normally do to get a vaccine through. We did large animal studies, lots of different animals, and then large clinical trials in people. So for example, with uh, Pfizer and Moderna, the number of people in those clinical trials exceeded 30,000. But then we've got real world experience exceeding billions of doses now, where again, we've monitored the safety and the efficacy of these vaccines, and it stacks up. It's very much the same as the clinical trials, very high levels of safety and very high levels of efficacy. And that's why we're so confident to use these vaccines. Okay, um, well then, what about the, uh, the, another question that comes up from time to time is about the, the, the strains that we use in the, in the vaccine. Um, what if there's a change? What if the, you know, we've heard about the COVID variation. Um, what about, how does that impact the effectiveness of the vaccine? And is there, should we be concerned about that, that it may not be effective? Yeah, at the moment, there's no cause for concern. I mean, one of the strengths of our response to this virus is that we're, we're doing what we're calling that genomic sequencing. So we're analysing in great detail the sequence of the virus for nearly every case we see in Australia at the moment. And so we are picking up some subtle changes, which is what happens with every virus, to be honest. In fact, the rate of change of this virus is relatively low. When those changes look like they're going to cause some problems, we call it a, a variant of interest and we assess that more carefully. And if we do find a change, then we call it a variant of concern, like we did with Delta being a little bit more infectious and, and perhaps a little bit more severe as well. The really good thing about all the variants we've discovered so far, all the ones we're talking about, is our vaccines still protect us really well. And there's a chance that we'll get a new variant in time, whether that's weeks, months or years away, 
where our vaccines may not give us that same level of protection. But the good news there is all the leading vaccine manufacturers for all the vaccines we're using now are basically practicing making vaccines for new variants. And they'll be able to either add that in or substitute for a, for a new strain or new variant in their vaccine in a relatively short space of time, if or when that need arises. But so far, there's no need to make any changes. Okay, thanks. Uh, what, back to you. Um, the, uh, what, what if somebody has underlying medical conditions? Um, uh, I mean, at what point does it become unsafe to have the vaccine with underlying medical conditions? I guess one of the basic rules is that if someone is concerned that their medical condition predisposes them to side effects of the vaccine, you've got to remember that probably increases their risk of dying from COVID. So when we've talked to people about their illness and talked about the side effects, as Paul's just mentioned, there is very rare reasons why we can't actually vaccinate anyone. ACT has got a 99% vaccination rate, which confirms all of those working in the area that there's probably 1% of the community who've actually got legitimate reasons not to have the vaccines. And a lot of the time we can test with one if we think there's a reaction, we actually switch the vaccine to a separate one. So if someone's got a medical condition, to me, that just says there's a more of a reason for you to have the vaccine rather than say, no, I shouldn't have it because your side effects of the disease, which is interesting in itself, we've learned a lot about it. It attacks multiple organs in the body. It attaches to sites all over the body that the flu wouldn't do and to other viruses wouldn't do. And so that's why we end up with brain disease, lung disease, heart disease, pancreatic disease, and other organ disease, because this virus will go all over the body. So if you have a medical condition, to me, that's even more a reason to have a vaccine because you are more at risk of serious disease from the actual illness. Okay. Um, so the, the reason we're doing this presentation is because uh, in South Australia, um, vaccine uh, or vaccination against COVID uh, will be made mandatory in certain areas. Um, one of the claims that are made or one of the um, concerns, that the way a concern is expressed is by saying, well, look, hang on, this is my body. You can't tell me what, uh, what needs to go into it or what has to go into it. H how do we respond to those kinds of comments? Well, first of all, I think talk to the person who's going to give you the vaccine and actually have that, that conversation with them. Secondly, it's a safety issue. I think like we would approach uh, uh, shoes that uh, uh, mean if you drop something on your foot, you don't cut it off. Presumably, if you're going to face someone who's got a firearm, you wear some protective clothing or um, armour protection so you're not going to be shot. You're going to wear a hard hat if you're going into a construction area. So I, I think it's better to interpret the advice to say we want you to wear, uh, uh, to have a vaccine is the same as we say, we'd like you to wear a seatbelt, we'd like you to do something to make sure you're actually safe. There's also a second point that, that you don't want to share an illness with the people you love. So we're actually asking you to look after yourself. We're also asking you to look after the people you look after. And if you have a role in the community, we want to make sure that you're not actually making other people sick, you're not making your family sick. So there's a whole lot of reasons where it's about saying, this is actually a safety issue for me. This is actually making it safer for me. And when someone asks you to please be safe in your work environment, please be safe uh, when you go about what you do, that's as much a responsibility to self to make sure you're safe, not gonna get sick, but also the people around you aren't gonna get sick. So in my mind, that's why you're being asked to actually have a vaccine. It's not actually because someone's enjoying manipulating their control. It's not because they're trying to control you in a way that's dangerous. It's actually better and safer for you to be protected by this vaccine. Thank you. Um, Paul, back to you. Um, does uh, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, or can the COVID vaccine cause uh, autoimmune disease? In short, we don't think so. I mean, one of the things we have to remember with these vaccines is there are a lot of things that happen in terms of medical events uh, normally. So even before we've got a, a big vaccine campaign and we are trying to vaccinate the majority of the population. So that means all of the medical events that we would have normally had before the COVID vaccine existed 
will coincidentally uh, occur in people who are vaccinated. And we've seen that with so many conditions. And so just because something's happened after someone's vaccinated doesn't mean the vaccine caused that. So there's a big difference between correlation and causation. So there may be some people who get diagnosed with an autoimmune condition after they've had the vaccine, but for the vast majority of those, we don't think the vaccines actually cause those. Okay, and what about somebody who's actually taking an immune suppressive drug? Um, what is there any risk uh, in being vaccinated if my immune system is compromised in some way? It's a very important question. And of course, uh, for, for people that have specific medical problems, I'd always encourage them to have a, a, a tailored discussion with their uh, GP or specialist or, or vaccine provider. The interesting thing about a lot of these conditions uh, is that they don't really significantly reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine. They don't carry an additional risk in terms of being vaccinated, but those conditions certainly increase the risk of those people having more significant disease from COVID. So in fact, people that have a lot of these conditions that uh, might want more information about the vaccine are perhaps the highest priority in terms of getting vaccinated. So again, I'd encourage people to have a uh, discussion with their specific specialist who, who knows more about the condition, but on the whole, those conditions are actually more reason to get vaccinated, not a reason to be concerned about the vaccine. Okay, and what about uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine on somebody with uh, a compromised immune system? It really depends on what sort of compromise they have, what sort of medicine they might be on or underlying condition. The good news though is the vaccine still provides at least some protection uh, across the board. And for those people whose immune systems are perhaps the weakest or the most compromised, well, now we have a strategy where we can give either a third dose for their primary vaccination or shortly thereafter boost them. So there's things we can do to boost the immunity in those people. This has been proven to be safe and an effective strategy. And of course, as I've said, those people are actually most likely at the greatest risk of uh, negative outcomes from this infection. So such a high priority to make sure they're vaccinated. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, Rod, back to you. Um, it's understood uh, that the fatality rate of COVID is less than 1%. And that's according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, as I understand it. Um, so if that's the case, and if 70% of staff are already vaccinated, why is, important, why is it important for me to also be vaccinated? There's a couple of issues around still catching the infection and spreading it. The disease you get if you are vaccinated could end up affecting you for life. And so not only is there the acute infection which puts you in intensive care and kills you, there's the long COVID which can permanently affect your lungs. And when talking to people overseas in this region, um, we were getting some reports that lung transplants were becoming the norm for people with severe COVID. So that's the lifelong effects of the damage done. There's also things like diabetes, um, chronic fatigue, tiredness. In the UK, they're talking about a million people with long COVID out of a six and a half, seven million dollar, uh, six and a half, seven million persons with the infection. So they're talking about one in six, one in seven people ending up with long COVID. So if you're not vaccinated, there's a risk of more severe disease. If you are vaccinated, there's still a risk of disease. Vaccine doesn't stop you getting an infection. It means it's going to be less severe. There's less chance of spreading it. So there is always a good reason to be vaccinated. We'd like to have 99% of everyone vaccinated so we can minimise those risks of, first of all, severe infection. Secondly, anything that's going to be transmitted. And thirdly, long COVID, we'd like to stop. Okay. Um, and my, my last a couple of questions relate to somebody who is um, planning a family. Um, is the vaccine dangerous for pregnant women? We've got no evidence to think it is. And it's a similar experience to what we found with influenza. But when we had our last pandemic, a third of the people ended up in intensive care were pregnant women. And that was unusual. And we now know that when someone's pregnant and they get COVID, they're actually more likely to end up in intensive care. So there's a higher risk. The severity of the disease is worse, not only bad for them, but also for their child. So there's no reason to think it's 
uh, um, going to cause any fertility. It just, it's not biologically plausible. Maybe we can ask Paul to give some more technical reasons, but there's certainly nothing. It's also an interesting story that we've known for, for years that every time a new vaccine comes, there's usually some sort of story that this vaccine's going to sterilise the population. And we've known for 200 years ever since vaccines were invented that that sort of story goes around. We've seen with whooping cough, there was stories that that was going to sterilise people. So it seems that's a common story people make up just because they're trying to fear monger. And there's no evidence here. And we've had thousands of people who were pregnant. Uh, there's been um, no side effects from the vaccines, but we know that it's more, the disease COVID is actually worse in people who are pregnant. Um, so, and you've, you've kind of semi-answered my last question, um, but you did ask Paul to uh, for comment, and maybe I'll ask you this one, Paul. Um, does the vaccine affect male or female fertility? Simple answer there again is no. And as we've heard, it's a, a common myth that's been propagated for, for reasons that aren't clear, some of those historic but we've looked really carefully at the vaccine in terms of how it works and, and those sort of side effects. Looking into some of these issues is part of the preclinical testing in animals. And it's something that's observed really carefully in the clinical trials. And of course, it's part of that real world experience. And we've not seen any signals there in terms of fertility, ability to conceive down the track, uh, or any signals of any adverse outcomes in, in pregnancy. And we've also heard that, of course, being sick with COVID uh, is such a, a devastating thing to happen in pregnancy with quite high rates of complications. And obviously, if people are, are unwell and in the process of trying to conceive, um, then that's obviously going to be an additional challenge there. So um, we know the vaccines go a really long way to, to making uh, uh, those sort of experiences safe as well. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you, Rod. And uh, to our audience, um, I hope this has been uh, helpful. Uh, if you still have questions about any of these issues, or you have other questions that you'd like to put forward, uh, please contact Mark and he can pass those uh, questions on to us. And there will be uh, an opportunity to uh, speak directly to both Rod and Paul. Uh, and perhaps a, a third member of our team um, at a later date. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.